Good morning. It's good to see everyone here. Good crowd here today. We have visitors in our audience. We're grateful that you're here. Glad that you're come to visit with us. Our first song will be number 234, Higher Ground. 234. Following this song, Brother Kurt Stewart will direct our minds in our opening prayer. <coughs> Join with me, please. 234. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane. Feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these are bound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on Satan's darts at me are heard, for faith has called the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Do you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us and this chance that we have to come and worship you together. Lord, we pray today as we worship that our hearts and our minds will be in the right place and the worship that we give to you and the praise that we give to you is pleasing. Lord, we pray that we able, that we're able to focus on this, and, and thank you so much for this blessing, Lord. Thank you for all the blessings that you give us. You give us so much. Help these blessings to never get in the way of the type of people that we need to be and the things that are important. Help us to always keep these things in perspective. Lord, we pray that you continue to bless us. Lord, thank you so much for our health. We pray that we thank you for this, and we pray that you be with all of those who are having health problems right now, those who are sick, those who are struggling and those who have lost loved ones lord we pray that you comfort them and help us to do our part to help in any way that we can lord go with us as we go forward in our lives lord we pray that we're the type of people that you'd have us to be and that as your followers and as christians lord we set good examples lord forgive us when we're wrong and help us to forgive those who who offend us and those who who wrong us lord and we pray that you be with this country and help us to Go forward and, and be the very best people that we can be and, and get along, Lord, and help us to solve our problems and help us to be stronger. And, Lord, we pray that in all things we always look to you. Heavenly Father, we pray that you always will help us to look out for those around us who need help and help us to be like Jesus who gave everything that he had and he, he, he taught and he lived everything that he taught, and he gave his life for us. Thank you so much for that blessing. Help us to follow him, and it's in his name we ask everything. Amen. Before Justin 
presents the thoughts he prepared before the Lord's table. It's seen of 384. Lead me to Calvary. 384. <coughs> King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony. instituted in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But each first day of the week we should come together. As we begin, I ask you to remove the thoughts, the burdens, and the struggles of the world and focus solely on the cross. One thing I'd also like you to do is, as I read some of the scriptures today, try to relate to the pain and the struggle that our Lord and Savior went through. I beg to say that it's almost impossible for any of us to truly relate. Um, but there are multiple accounts that I pulled from, um, some of my thoughts. Um, one account obviously is Mark chapter 15, Luke the 23rd chapter. But I'll primarily be reading from John chapter 18 and 19. Um, as we come, as we notice in chapter 18, in verses 17, verses 25 and 27, Simon Peter denies God. When asked if he was seen in the garden with him, in verse 26, he denies him for the third time. We also see in verse 39. But you have a custom that I should release someone for it to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release you, the king of the Jews? Then they all cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. In another account, Barabbas is mentioned as a murderer. Sadly, our Lord and Savior was looked over for murder and a robber. Immediately in the following verses, we see in chapter 19, as it begins, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, or whipped him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and then put on him a purple robe, and they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. If we continue on, we see in verse 34 that they... But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. As I mentioned, as you try to relate, I beg to say that none of us can truly relate to the pain and suffering of our Lord and Savior. But we must, each first day of the week, remember those sacrifices he made for us. If you go with me in prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning to memorialize you as we come together thanking you for this bread that represents your body that was whipped and pierced and tortured on that cruel cross for us. We pray, Lord, as we partake of the bread that we do so in a worthy manner that is well pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. continue we'll pray over the cup our heavenly father we take this fruit of the vine representation of the blood that you lost on that cruel cross we say thanks as we remember you and your ultimate sacrifice for us we pray once again that these things are done in a worthy manner that's well pleasing to you in Christ's name we pray amen hymn of encouragement this morning will be number 707, 707, if you'd like to mark that, to Christ be loyal and be true. Then before the lesson, a couple of songs, first one, number 337, is thy heart right with God? Have thine affections been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? Dost thou count all things for Jesus but loss? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Dominion or self and or sin is thy heart right with God. Over all evil without and within is thy heart right with God. Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. control, is thy heart right with God? Dost thou each moment abide in thy soul? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Six hundred forty-nine. The rock that is higher than I. Six hundred forty-nine. 
If it's convenient with you, please stand up and sing 649. <coughs> Oh, sometimes the shadows are deep And rough seems a path to the goal And sorrows, how often they sweep Like tempest down over the soul Oh, then to the rock let me fly To the rock that is higher than I that is higher than I. Oh, sometimes how long seems the day, and sometimes I weary my feet, but toiling in life's dusty way, the rock's blessed shadow how sweet. Oh, then to the rock let me fly, to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, then to the rock let me fly, to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, near to the rock let me keep our blessings, our songs. Deep, or walking the shadowy veil. Oh, then to the rock, let me fly to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, then to the rock, let me fly to the rock that is higher than I. As we start, would you do two things with your Bible? First of all, would you open your Bible and mark in your Bible 2 Corinthians chapter 10? If you can find a Bible ribbon marker or a pen or a pencil, maybe a piece of paper, if you grab the bulletin, you can just lay it in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And then once you've done that, open your Bible to 1 Chronicles chapter 12. 1 Chronicles chapter 12. So we're going to end up in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to start with a reference in 1 Chronicles chapter 12. On a Sunday evening in October of 1938, Matter of fact, it was Halloween weekend. It was October 30th of 1938. A man by the name of Orson Welles and a group of trained voice actors along with a very well-skilled orchestra of people broke onto the air, not TV, but radio, and presented an adaptation of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. I don't know if you've ever listened to that. It's archived. You can hear the entire hour in which the War of the Worlds was presented, but it was presented live via radio on October 30th of 1938. And Orson Welles is the narrator of that particular hour's worth of programming, along with the other voice actors and the orchestra to provide sound and music to go along with it. But he began by explaining as he opened the airways that there were scientists who had discovered explosions on Mars some time back. And then it very shortly after translated into some very large cylindrical metal objects that were floating over major cities around the entire world, especially American cities. And people began to be really panicky about what might be going on. And so a delegation of 
United States citizens was sent to uh, approach this large cylindrical object and lo and behold the, the, the uh, residents of it, the aliens on the inside of that large sphere in the sky, they were not uh, friendly at all. They were very hostile and a, and a heat ray uh, disintegrated, just incinerated the delegation that was sent to do that and then just everything broke loose afterward. City after city after city in America was being destroyed by these heat rays. Large robotic creatures were just going through and decimating everything in their path. And the, the, the hour just worked and worked and worked to this climactic end that we were just losing everything. Everything was out of control. For an hour, that drama continued. It is suggested, though not the entire United States was listening to it at the time, but there was a fairly sizable listening audience to that particular station, and they were listening to Orson Welles narrate the essential destruction of the United States and of the world, and there were a lot of people who were listening who were in abject fear and panic over what they were hearing. Of course, it was just drama. It was just fiction. You know, in the end, after all was done and said, people were laughing about it, but they weren't laughing when they were hearing what was taking place. Now, 1938, I mean, you'd have to be 82 plus years to even remember the live presentation of that and probably, you know, sometime beyond that to have actually had the, you know, the, the capacity to take in that information. A lot of folks today have seen the movie version of that with Tom Cruise, and it's, you know, presented in like fashion with... You know, aliens essentially taking over the universe. You know, the success of that radio program when it aired that hour, the success of that depended on the assumption on the part of most people, the fear, that two worlds cannot coexist together. It played on the fear that if there was ever an invading force into the world, the earth in which we live, it's never going to be pleasant because there would be two goals and those two goals would be incompatible with each other. And so it played on the fear of the inability of two things to coexist at once. I don't know the number. I could probably go back and count. I don't know the number of emails and phone calls and text messages and Facebook Messenger messages that I have gotten, probably the elders too, over the last, you know, over the last, what, three months, but especially within the last month, basically the last two months, where, this, where the question has been, what in the world is going on? It's happening. Our world has gone completely crazy. What's going on? I took a couple of headlines just this last week in not just the Chattanooga Times News Free Press, right, but in New York Times, some other major newspapers. Listen to some of the headlines just over the last week or two. Quote, American man confesses to stabbing wife to death while vacationing in France, end quote. Quote, 15 people wounded in shooting at a Chicago funeral home, end quote. More locally, quote, two brothers, girlfriend, arrested in the massacre, the massacre of three best friends, end quote. Quote, inside the new LGBTQ affirming church in New York's Chinatown, end quote. That'll probably get our video banned from YouTube for saying that. <laughs> quote, churches split after gay marriage issue delayed, end quote. More recently, quote, U.S. Supreme Court versus the First Amendment. End quote. Here's another one. More than 70% of Americans were not financially healthy before the pandemic. End quote. You think, what, what is going on? And, and besides all of those, just the, just the regular routine news that we've had over, what, the last decade or so, where you have school shootings and drug abuse and teen pregnancy. So I get why, and I have myself been asking, what is going on? How is our world falling apart like that? What we are experiencing is a war of the worlds. Not in an alien invasion sense, not in the sense that America is under attack from something that is beyond the earth and beyond our known universe. That's not what we're experiencing. What we have front row seats to right now is a war, a spiritual, a cultural war of ideas. 
We're experiencing a war where worlds are colliding and it is a, it's a war of worldviews. That's what's happening in our world. If your Bible is open to 1 Chronicles chapter 12, it's interesting there's a story about the formation of David's army. He's getting his forces together, right? They're getting ready to go into battle, and it begins to outline some of the skill sets of the people that are a part of David's army. In verse 23, the Bible says, Now these were the numbers of the divisions that were equipped for the war. And came to David at Hebron to turn over the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. Of the children of Judah, bearing shield and spear, 6,800 armed for the war. Now you would need people that knew how to wield a weapon if you're going into war. Verse 25, of the children of Simeon, mighty men of valor fit for war, 7,100. You would need extremely courageous and valiant people if you're going to do that. Often that's the turning point of a battle to have sort of an optimistic outlook going in. Verse 26, of the children of Levi, 4,600. Uh, Jehoiada, the leader of the Aaronites, and with him 3,700. Zadok, a young man, a valiant warrior, and from his father's house, 22 captains. Then you've got the children of Benjamin listed there in verse 29. Verse 30, you've got some people from Ephraim. Then you've got verse 31, you've got the half-tribe of Manasseh, but watch verse 32. Going into battle, here's what David knew they needed going into the battle. Verse 32. Of the children of Issachar. Notice. Who had understanding of the times. They knew what was going on. To know what Israel ought to do. How do, how do we even react, David? Well, we need some people who understand what's going on in the world. There's no way to relate to what's happening in our world unless we understand what is going on in the world. And so they appointed men who had understanding of the times. So it's a very relevant question, right? We've all been asking it. What's going on in our world? Has the world lost its mind? What we're witnessing is a war of the worlds. And what we want to do over the next couple of weeks is to affirm what we believe to be the absolutely right, according to the Bible, view of the world. A worldview that transcends all other worldviews. And that's why we're now going to open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In that book, Paul was con you know, he's contending against some charges and challenges to his authority. And they had their own moral and ethical issues that they were dealing with. There was some infighting in the congregation. And they were still dealing with some sin in the congregation. And what they had was a competition of ideas. And Paul is going to say, there is a goal in Christianity to suppress all bad ideas so that we win the allegiance of men and women, their hearts to Jesus Christ. So notice in verse 1. Paul says, now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. That'd be his, his attitude going into this battle. Who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold towards you. But I beg you that when I'm present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now especially note beginning in verse 3. This is going to be the, the crux of what we're discussing over the next couple of weeks. Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, right? We're physical. We walk around. We live physically up on the earth. He says, verse 3, we do not war according to the flesh. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now remember, he said it's not a physical battle, so the strongholds aren't physical. He's about to explain what they are. Verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing. If you have ESV, I think it even says there, lofty opinions that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So let's set the stage for what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks. Right? What we're facing is a battle of ideas in our world. We're seeing two completely different worlds collide up against each other. And we're going to be affirming over the next couple of things, or the next couple of weeks, truths that are the foundation of a worldview. God exists. 
The Bible is inspired and it's authoritative. There is one church. These things we're going to establish as we, as we work our way through the month. But I want to, I want to lay the groundwork today and make two points that are going to help us as we move forward. Here's the first. Number one, everybody, that's me, that's you, everybody, has a worldview. Everybody does. Listen, listen to these verses. Let's go back and notice in verse 5. Notice what Paul's doing. He says, casting out arguments and every high thing, every uh, lofty opinion against some translation, say, that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So he's talking about arguments, ideas, beliefs. And notice that in the passage, he has two sets of ideas in mind. There are some that are opposed to Jesus Christ. There's some ideas, some arguments that stand against the knowledge of God. And then there are ideas, arguments, beliefs, opinions that align themselves with the knowledge of God. But if you take the ones that stand opposed to God and the ones that are for God, that's all of them. And Paul is saying everybody, everybody has ideas. Everybody has a worldview. And when we say a worldview, what we mean is your interpretive framework. It's the way that we, it's the way that we process reality. Uh, the best illustration I ever heard was that our worldview is like a pair of glasses. Right? You put a pair of glasses on. And let's say that you find a, you know, walking down the street and you see a pair of glasses and they have red lenses in them. And you take those glasses and you put those glasses on and they have the red tint in the lenses. Does that change your perception of everything that you see around you? Colors might change. You see red tint in everything. It's just different now because the glasses that you have on are changing the way that you or I see everything that is around me. Uh, this past Christmas, I don't even know where they got them. Mom and Dad found them somewhere. For the girls, they found, uh, you know, like the old 3D glasses. You go into a movie theater and you put the 3D glasses on. And somehow, these particular glasses that when you would, when you would look at a light, especially like the, the LED Christmas lights, uh, you could look at a room where you had a tree with LED Christmas lights and all of a sudden, all of the room, there were gingerbread men. I don't know how the glasses were doing it. Or the, you could look and you could see reindeer, you know, you'd, you'd just everywhere you look. And so you had to have the glasses on to do that. If you take the glasses off, now all of a sudden there are no more reindeer, no more gingerbread men. But you, you put the glasses on and there's gingerbread men and there's, you know, there's snowmen or whatever, snowflakes. They're all over the place. Well, a worldview is like that. And we all have a worldview. The way that we process information comes through that worldview. And what we're seeing in our world is a clash of worldviews, a clash of ideas. Now, somebody might say, well, what's the big deal? The big deal is those ideals, every, every part of a worldview, ideas have consequences. Right? There's, a, there's a consequence to what we believe in this world. And, and Paul is even, even warning us of that, how that ideas have consequences. Because in verse 5, he said, some of those arguments, some of those ideas are against God. Some of those ideas are against God. In fact, in verses 3 and 4, when Paul starts talking about how that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, physical, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, those ideas that people have that are opposed to the knowledge of God, what he's saying is that there's not just a physical component to life, but a spiritual. And did you know that our ideas, every one of our ideas, affect not only our interaction in the physical, but also affect our perception of the spiritual realities that exist? That's how we understand when we look at the world that we can understand why, to the best of our ability, a group of men can hijack some planes and fly them into the World Trade Center and kill thousands of people. Their ideas had consequences. That's why we can, we can look at a person who creates a pyramid scheme and sucks the life savings out of innocent people and does it without a single ounce of guilt. How that person can do that because his ideas have some consequences. That's why when we look out in our world and we see people who kidnap and sex traffic young women and children and do so without seemingly a conscience, they say, well, this or that. And we can say, well, we know why they do it, at least in a sense, because they have a worldview and that worldview has consequences. You ought to read quotes from Adolf Hitler sometime about his understanding of the world. And then you can see how communism and Nazism took over. 
His ideas had consequences. Do me a favor. Would you go to uh, Romans chapter 1? Let's all go to Romans chapter 1. Start verse 18. Here's an example of that. Of this very thing. Notice in verse 18, he starts talking about what has been revealed. Now you have a, a contrast between the things that have been revealed and what people were willing to accept about the things that have been revealed. And so he's going to make it plain in this passage before we leave verse 20, before we get through these next couple of three verses, Paul is going to say there's no excuse for, for denying the existence of God or the things, the responsibilities that come from God, but that's what they did. Notice verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Notice the suppressing truth. That's a deliberate action to get rid of accountability and the knowledge of God. Verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. So they knew these things, but notice in verse 20, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. Nobody can legitimately say, oh, I didn't know there was a God, or I didn't know that he had authority, or I didn't know he had spoken, because those things are clearly presented to us. Watch verse 21. Because although they knew God, they understood that He was real. They understood His authority. They understood what He was saying. They did not glorify Him as God. That's choice. Neither were they thankful in gratitude, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore, because God is loving and He gives the choice, God gave them up to uncleanness and to the lust of their own hearts. That's, that's their choice. But God would let them do that to dishonor their bodies among themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie or for the lie and worshiped and served the creature, our world, the things that are created and made rather than the creator, the one who made all things, who is blessed forever. Now pause there. Do you, do you see what they've done? They've said, in our view of the world, in our understanding and perception of reality, we reject the knowledge of God. We do not want God as a part of our understanding of the world anymore. Do you think that idea has consequences? Yeah. Because look at verse 25, or 26 rather. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. How does that happen? Well, they've excluded God from their worldview. And now look what's happening. Verse 27, Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was me. How did they get there? Because those ideas have consequences. They're rejecting the knowledge of God from their worldview. How about verse 28? Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they didn't want God as a part of the way they perceive reality. God gave them over to a debased mind. That means he allowed them to do that, to do those things which are not fitting. Look at the results, verse 29. All unrighteousness, sexual immorality, that's fornication, wickedness, covetousness, Maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whispering, that's gossiping, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Those are the products, the consequences of an idea. And here's what we do. We say, well, but in our world it's different. Most people believe in God. So that doesn't really apply, right? We don't, we, don't, uh, we don't get to just make a broad statement about how ideas have consequences. I mean, how can our world be so messy when the majority of the people in our world believe in God? That's not really true. In fact, if we go back in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Notice in verse 5 and in verse 6, he says at the end of verse 5, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. In verse 6, being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. What God's goal is, is for the heart to be full of Christ. That's how a worldview is created and developed. That's how a proper understanding of reality is, is, is maintained, and yet so infrequently we do that. See, here's what we do. Here's our typical approach to a worldview. It's like a, if you can imagine a pie, right? You have a, 
a pie, you put your favorite pie down there, whatever it is. Coconut cream pie, pecan pie, you just chocolate, whatever it is. When you get a pie, unless you're not sharing, you're going to cut it in pieces, right? So typically you're going to make, you know, a couple of even cuts, one direction and the opposite, and then you're going to go between those and you're going to end up with eight pieces of a pie. Um, we had Grace Lee's party yesterday and we had a, Beverly made a big, a big pan of Mexican cornbread, and I thought, I'm going to make this last. I'm going to cut it in 16 pieces instead of eight. And there was none left by the time I got to it, so it was all gone. Um, but you have pieces of pie. And you know what you do? When you, when you want a piece, you take one piece. It's not touching the others because it's been cut away, and you take that piece out, and you do with that piece what you want. And that's how we construct worldviews in our culture. God is a piece of the pie, but He's not the whole pie. And that's how we do it, right? That is, that is exactly how we explain how somebody can mismanage their money, not pay their bills on purpose, and refuse to be financially responsible, and yet come to a church building on a Sunday and say, I love God. It's because we have one section of our life that is designated for God, but God doesn't affect all the other areas of our life. That's how we do it. That's how sometimes people can walk into a, a, a voting booth and put their vote down for the most ungodly things in the world and yet still profess love for God because it's only one piece of their life. That's how, we can, that is how we can be unaffected by some of the tragedies in our world because we have a piece of the pie that is for God and then the other pieces of the pie are unaffected by the other pieces of the pie. And the way we perceive mercy and justice and the way we perceive our law or our history is disconnected from God. And that is not the way that it works. That is not the way a worldview, biblically speaking, is supposed to operate. Uh, let's look at an example. Would you go with me to Luke chapter 12? I've been thinking about this one a lot this week. Luke 12. Do you remember the parable that Jesus gives of a rich man who tears down his barns and builds bigger barns? Do you remember that one? And it is... It has begun and ended with Jesus warning people about how stuff doesn't matter. Life does not consist in the abundance of the things that a person possesses. Remember, he starts it that way and he'll end it that way. In fact, in verse 21, he'll say, So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Because we know the story. The man builds his you know, barns and he's, he never thinks about God. And the more I thought about this, that parable happens in a context. I just didn't, it's my fault for not recognizing it over the years. It's not profound. I didn't, this is not novel truth. I didn't just come up with it, but I just hadn't thought about it a lot. But it's a great illustration of what we're, what we're talking about now. Look at the context of this. If you go back in, in my Bible, I have to turn a page back, but if I were to go back in chapter 11, and I'm trying to pick up on who it is that Jesus is talking to, back in chapter 11 in verse 37, this is still part of the greater conversation, verse 37, as he spoke, this is the Lord speaking, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went and sat down to eat. The Pharisees, they were Jews, right? Religious people, Jewish religious leaders, well, that's part of the crowd that Jesus is talking to. Drop down to verse 45, chapter 11. Then one of the lawyers, these would be religious lawyers, religious lawyers answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you approach us also. Then he continues the conversation. Then if we get down to chapter 12 and we look at verse 1, in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples. And so you've got these religious leaders and you've got the disciples who were there. And then in verse 13, down in verse 13 of chapter 12, you've got that same crowd still calling him teacher. Would it be fair to say that Jesus is speaking to a group of Jews? And when Jesus related to a group of people with stories, he used things that were relevant in their own culture, meaning that the person represented in chapter 12, beginning in verse 16, this parable of the rich man, this rich man was not an atheist. This was not somebody out of a pagan culture that they could not relate to. Jesus is talking about somebody that they could relate to. It might as well have been a Jew, a believer in God. And yet now here is a man who is lost because he mismanages his possessions and he never forgot God what he had done. He had segmented his life so that his economics, so that his finances were one piece of the pie and God was another and he was lost for that. We will be lost 
for not having a worldview where everything in our worldview is all about Jesus. I'm going to get involved in politics, but it's going to be the way Jesus did. I'm going to be involved in history, but I'm going to understand it the way our Lord did. I want to be involved in justice, but I want justice the way that God renders justice because only then do I have a right worldview. I can't segment my life and keep God away from everything else. God is the, he is the, the center of everything that I do. He touches everything in my life. But every person has a worldview. When you look out in our world and you see the craziness that's happening, the war that's taking place, it is competing worldviews clashing up against each other. It's the biblical worldview versus everything else. Number two, I get in trouble in the world for saying this. Not every worldview is right. Not every worldview is right. In fact, only one is correct. Notice again. We're going to be unapologetic for saying this. We'll be kind in saying it, but we're going to be unapologetic. In verse 5, Paul says, bringing every, every thought, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's when the worldview is right. When every single way, that I th every, every avenue of my thinking, every discipline to which I apply myself, everything is brought under the headship of Jesus Christ. That is our goal. To convert every single person in this world into a right understanding of Jesus. We should not be satisfied until everyone's heart is full of Christ. Not just a piece of the pie, but the whole pie, so to speak. In fact, Paul said in verse 6, as we've read already, that when he came, he would be ready to punish the people who were standing against those who were trying to do the right thing because they had bad ideas. He said, I want to punish the people who are still standing against the truth. Do you know what that means? It means that there is a right and wrong in this world. Definitively objective right and wrong in this world. See, that's part of our problem in this world, isn't it? People don't understand reality anymore. We believe that, that truth is this fluid thing that kind of fills the form and whatever it's in, but it's not concrete and objective. And that's what truth is. It's fixed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says that you all speak the same thing, that you be of the same mind and of the same judgment. Isn't it amazing that our Creator, our Maker, believes that we can all believe exactly the same thing? That's because truth is real. It's objective. In 1 John 2, in verse 21, John says, No lies of the truth. No lies of the truth, meaning that something is either true or it's a lie. That's our reality. But we're in trouble. There's been some research done as of late. Just a few years ago, there was a, a Pew Research Group, and they reached out and they were trying to find just faith-affirming church-going folk. And they wanted to know what is taking place in the pews. Now, I realize this is, it, would be, it would bound beyond the scope of just the Lord's Church. But Christianity, Christen, Christendom in general, and they found that only 17%, 17%, of regular church-going, faith-affirming people have a real biblical worldview. In fact, they found in those same polls that almost 40%, 40% out of all practicing Christians are sympathetic to the teachings of Islam. That almost the same number, almost 40% of that number agreed with Marxism and Communism. That over 50%, 54% had postmodern views of the world. And so they do studies and they find out in these studies that over 85% of the people that populate the world out of eight, almost what, going on nine billion people in the world, 85% believe that truth is circumstantial. That feeling takes precedent over fact. And so we have our work cut out for us, right? When we're reaching out to convert the world, it's to, it is to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But there's a battle of ideas that has to be, it has to be, Wades through, right? We've got, to, we've got to convert the mind so that every thought is under, under obedience to Christ. Every thought, every, everything that we do, every, every, every aspect, whether I manage my money, my politics, no matter what it is, everything falls under the purview of Jesus is my Lord. And that's how I'm going to view this subject. So we're going to start this month. We're going to affirm some truths that aren't as popular in our world anymore, but they're the foundation of the biblical worldview. God is real. He really does exist. 
And if you don't, and if I don't get that part right, then there's no hope of anything beyond this life. And some of the misery in this world is absolutely based on the fact that we have for years taught evolution in school and we have robbed out of the hearts of our young people the belief that God is real. No wonder, they're, no wonder they have a meaningless outlook on life when we strip that away from our young people. We need, to, we need to affirm to the world that this book is not outdated. It is not outmoded. It is not just a, a part of a culture of years gone by. That this book is absolutely every bit as relevant right now today and every bit as authoritative right now today as it was when Jesus spoke it and when the apostles wrote it. It is. That's what it is. What we need to do is tell the world, Jesus Christ, though you may deny Him, He really is the Son of God. He really did come out of the grave on the third day. He's your only hope of salvation. We don't believe in pluralism. There are no other saviors besides Jesus Christ. What we need to do is to say there is a way of acting and thinking that harmonizes with the Lord who died on the cross. And anything outside of that is not right. That's what we need to do is to get people back to understanding this because the only hope of quelling the war that's taking place is to get people to, a, an, in their mind, obedience to Christ. That's what Paul said. Okay. So that what we're experiencing is a war of the world's. Not the Orson Welles type, but a war of worldviews. That's what's happening. Let's start today. Let's start off right. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, let's, let's start our journey together by at least starting there. In the New Testament, our covenant for today, there's some conditions that we have to meet for salvation. It doesn't mean we're earning salvation. It doesn't mean that God owes it to us, but as the giver of the gift, God has the right to set some conditions on it, and He does. So He puts a couple of conditions down. He wants us, first of all, it, it has to be some kind of change of the heart. So it, there has to be an intake of information. We have to hear it, Romans 10, 17. And then we have to believe it, John 8, 24. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. We really, really, really believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's not just fanciful campfire talk, right? We're not just passing legend down from one generation to generation and say, hey, you know what, as stories go, this is the best story of them all. We're not saying that. We're saying He really lived and He really is the answer and we really believe that. Do you believe that? And based on that belief, would you be willing to repent of sin? Repentance is simply a change of mind. Knowing what our Lord did I don't want to live on purpose in sin anymore. I want to turn away from that. That's repentance. And then surely we would be willing to make a confession with our mouth. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then to go down in water, buried in water, just like He was buried in the grave and raised again on the third day, we go down. Our, our conversion is a simulation of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a pattern of that. That he did. So we go down in the water, we're buried, we come up out of the water, and when we do, having been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, we're clean. We're a new creation according to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. That's the starting point. And then we've got the hard work cut out for us. It's not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind and, and every single day. We don't have it all worked out at first. I don't have it all worked out. I've been a Christian for a number of years. I'm still, I'm still working on it. I'm a work in progress. But what I'm trying to do is every single area of life, everything, as a citizen, as an employee, as a father, as a husband, everything, I'm trying to bring under obedience in my mind to Christ. Because only then do I have a right worldview. Right? That's what we're trying to do. Sometimes we get out of line. Sometimes we're off track completely. We need to come back. We can do it through repentance, confession, and prayer when we do that. Sometimes we need the help of our brethren. We need to ask for prayers of the church. But we have a war going on. I, I don't know the number of times, but there's a bunch in there in the New Testament where Paul says, we're calling soldiers of the Christ. We're calling you to the forefront. Come on, let's fight. I want you to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Fight the good fight of the faith. Keep it up. Put on the whole armor of God. We're being called to a war of the worlds. We are the front line right here in this room. We're it. Will you join the fight? Would you put every thought that you have in subjection to Jesus as your Lord? Would you do it as we stand and as we sing? Could Christ be loyal and be true this Oh,
great volunteers to stand against the clubs in moon not by frowns or fears to Christ the Lord be true for he will go with you and help you all conflicts through to Christ the Lord be true to Christ be loyal and be true in no service proof your faith and your fidelity the fervor of your love to Christ the Lord be true for he will go with you and help you all conflicts through to Christ the Lord be true to Christ be loyal and be true and he will be your friend defending and protecting you to life's triumphant end to Christ the Lord be certainly welcome everyone here this morning to come out to worship. We have 127 in attendance this morning, which is certainly far short of the, our regular number. Back, back, back in our regular days, however, we're pleased that you're here. Someone came up with an idea, and I won't blame Keith Heron with this, but anyway, <laughs> he said, why don't we take those comfortable chairs out of the young adult class, put them up front, and if they do, one of them's reserved for me, okay? <laughs> uh, but anyway, so... There's always a reluctance to sit on front. What if that was the most comfortable seats in the entire auditorium? All right, so uh, that's something we'll take under consideration. So if you see the black seats up here next week in leather, remember one of them's mine. Okay, <laughs> a couple of updates on the board. This is uh, in the bulletin and also on the board. Tom Haithcutt's cousin, I mean not cousin, nephew, has now recovered from the COVID-19 virus. We're glad to report that. And also Tina Brown in the bullseye, she had a major surgery with a malignant tumor removed. However, she's ready to go home. The only hindrance today is blood pressure. When they get that under control, she will be returning home. So we're glad to report that. That's all we have. If you'll bow your head now, we'll be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time thanking you for the privilege we have of coming out and worship you today. Thanking you for the blessings you bestow upon us recognizing dear lord that because of your goodness because of your kindness and because of your promise of eternal life that we are obligated to serve you in such a way that will be pleasing unto you may we always remember that pray that you'll go with us as we walk our daily lives that everything we do would be a positive reflection upon you and upon your son and upon us as christians go with us in all things be with those unable to be with us this morning, dear Lord, due to physical illness or whatever the cause may be that physically are, are prevents them from being here. Also, dear Lord, we can't forget those that are willfully chosen not to be here with nothing to do with caution or the virus, anything, just their own, their own free will. We pray that something may be done, said or done, to again return them to worship with us. Go with us now, dear Lord. Keep us safe. Be with travelers. Give them a safe journey back to their home. Uh, be with us as we go through this week. Bring us back uh, next, next time we meet for another worship service. Thank you for all you do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.